thank you for having me and it's just been so inspiring to sit here and listen to all the fantastic speakers and to be part of this event. Um, my talk's going to take a little bit of a different tact. Maybe it is fitting to be the last one because I don't know about you but my brain is slightly spinning about how can I change things in my diet and my lifestyle and how I live my life to um, prevent all of these terrible things that are due to happen for our planet. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, sort of how we navigate those challenges and maybe how we can be inspired by some amazing species that exist and are on the front lines of climate change themselves. And also how can we sort of take comfort in the fact that we're all going through this and none of us are perfect. Um, and it's a bit of a journey for all of us. So I was recently on a work trip with some colleagues. We went out for dinner and it was a rare meal out for me, so I was very excited. I love food. I'm the biggest, I think if I wasn't in the environment, I would be in the food industry in some way. Um, and when the waiter came to ask us all what we wanted to order, I was last and it was Falafel, halloumi, falafel, super salad. And me, organic steak, please. Um, and glances were exchanged. I stuck with the steak, it was delicious. But I couldn't help but feel completely gripped by feelings of guilt and shame um, and embarrassment that I was the only meat eater around the table. Um, when I knew for a fact there were others as well. I felt like I had a huge tattoo across my forehead saying, I'm an environmentalist, I work in conservation, and I'm not a vegetarian. Um, there's many facets of the vegan and vegetarian diet which I'm a huge fan of I'm plant based I tried being vegan it didn't work well for me I did not feel good physically um, I interview scientists as part of my job um, and hear them or they show me data telling us what a catastrophe we're in and I follow brave social media activists and climate activists on social media who advocate very compellingly loud arguments for how we should live a certain way and what we should and shouldn't do and I work with and know farmers who have taught me more about the power of food provenance and how to work with the land and how to eat more so than any of those activists. So safe to say, as you probably have gathered from this evening, we cannot eat reliably if we don't have a functioning, resilient environment in place. But the journey of how to get there is really complex and difficult to navigate. And often a good balanced approach to navigating um, adversity comes from a really good gut instinct, no pun intended. Um, and when I find myself grappling with these sort of moral dilemmas, I look to nature because the plant and animal kingdom are absolute professionals when it comes to navigating adversity and relying on instinct. So to help us with this, I'm gonna introduce us to three amazing species, all of which are in their own way fighting on the front lines of climate change in the British Isles. Now, I first came to know these species whilst writing my book, Forget Me Not, and I didn't know anything about them. But what I do know now, urgently, is that each of these species in their own way represents a key link in the food chain. And as with any chain, when a link is severed, weakened or broken, everything collapses. And the same goes, as you probably now know, um, after these amazing talks, um, the same goes for our own food chain. So the first species I want to introduce you to is a primary producer, also known as a plant. And this plant is called seagrass. Very lucky in Cornwall to have lots of seagrass. Now this is a hero habitat. It is so difficult to resist the temptation to call it a silver bullet because it just does so many amazing things for our planet, for us, offers incredible ecosystem services. It's hailed as both the wonder plant and the ugly duckling in the same breath. Um, and I love how understated it is. It is literally fields of grass around the world in sheltered bays under the water. It's very quiet but oh my goodness, it's so incredible. Um, it has this amazing ability to bury and store carbon up to 35 times faster than a tropical rainforest. I didn't learn that in school, but I did learn about tropical rainforests, but I would have preferred to learn this because it's at home. Makes more sense. It can be the most incredible nursery habitat for thousands of marine species existing around our coastline. It flowers and goes to seed every year, just like any grassland. And yet it also is pollinated by teams of crustaceans, which is just the most insane image. Um, it also does amazing things for protecting us from extreme weather. So we're an island nation, we have extreme weather, climate change is gifting us more extreme weather, thank you very much. And the amazing thing about seagrass meadows is they effectively act like this massive speed bump, where if a storm surge is coming, it will hit the seagrass and sort of the energy will be slowed and absorbed by the seagrass meadow, reducing coastal erosion. 
And one of my favorite bits of research about seagrass comes from the Mediterranean, where they've since discovered within the meadows these things called Neptune balls, which kind of look a bit like coconuts. And these form as a result of the fronds of grass within seagrass, literally capturing and bundling microplastics and then bundling them into these, these fibrous balls and holding them within the meadow, effectively preventing an onward oceanic journey, which is just amazing. We used to have lots more seagrass than exists today, um, but since the 1980s, a horrible combination of human disturbance, pollution and disease has made us, been, we've been losing seagrass meadows at a rate of up to 14,000 square meters per hour since 1980. And in the UK, we've lost 92% of seagrass in the last 100 years. However, we're very lucky to have charities in the UK, like Project Seagrass, which are working to rapidly restore these meadows. And it's so inspiring to me because it's almost like this amazing disaster relief effort where this charity and numerous others are galvanizing change in the most positive, joyful way. They are connecting local coastal communities with their lost seagrass meadows. They are enlisting the support of school children to help them pack hessian bags. They found that children can be excellent workers. Um, <laughs> packing these hessian bags with seagrass seeds that are then deployed off of ribs around the coastline. And they're also partnering with universities like Swansea and Plymouth and Exeter. And I think the thing I love about the whole seagrass restoration effort is that in a world that is so incredibly noisy and it's so hard to know what to do, who to listen to, who to trust, um, the power of community and of a grassroots approach can be so powerful and Again, I think, you know, it's not shouty, it's not obnoxious, it's not performative, it's not image driven, it's just quietly getting on with vital, vital work. So that's seagrass. The second species I want to introduce, you, oh, there's some more seagrass. Um, look how happy it makes me. <laughs> um, that is quite performative. Uh, the second species I want to introduce you to, its story is one that uh, thrives on athleticism, of determination, and of never losing hope when everything is up against you. Atlantic salmon are a keystone species, which means that they have disproportionate importance in, a, in an environment relative to their number or size. Um, Keystone species act a bit like a cornerstone, so in any building or structure, I'm sure this structure probably has loads of cornerstones, if you remove a cornerstone, everything that has been built so carefully around it starts to destabilize. Um, Atlantic salmon are vital for nutrient cycling within a riparian ecosystem, so a river habitat, providing um, a future and ensuring survival for species from insects right the way up to ancient oak trees. Atlantic salmon have the most insane, well, one of the most insane migrations of any animal on the planet. This is a species that begins its life in the headwaters of a river, let's say the River Teen on Dartmoor, which is where I saw them. Um, and this is where they seek to return to in a few years' time. But before that, they have to go all the way out to sea, all the way out to Greenland or Iceland for a few years and then find their way home again. And so they will migrate downstream, they will go out into the estuary, they will enter the ocean, they will become a marine fish, which is insane. They will go to Iceland, Greenland, feed, grow, get bigger, and then a combination of environmental and biological cues will tell them it's time to go home and breed. And when I say home, I mean the exact spot where they were born. Um, but the trouble is, is that in the UK, salmon have been swimming in their lowest numbers since 1952. A 2020 survey found that 100% of all 1,500 rivers in the country are failing water quality tests. Um, I'm sure it's no news to all of you that we're in a water quality crisis. We have sewage in our rivers, in our seas. It is a very, very serious situation. And salmon already have a difficult life. I mentioned that they have to become a marine fish. They undergo the most astonishing physiological transformation. They begin life as a freshwater fish. They then become an ocean fish that has to tolerate salt water. And then they have to go back to being a freshwater fish. So all these amazing things happen internally within their cells, within their brains, within their gills. They have so much going on. Um, and they also have to be able to navigate back home without the use of Google Maps, no what three words. 
They have to do it all by themselves. They can tune into the Earth's magnetic field and use it as a compass. But research from the University of Exeter is finding that warming water temperatures, let alone pollution, I don't know if there's any research happening at the moment about that, but warming water is really bad news because it can disrupt this ancient homing instinct, an ancient mechanism, so much so that some fish are being found to stray into the wrong river and they can't get home. These fish are exhausted, they are tired, they are starving, and they are driven by the raw instinct to get home, to breed, and then die. Rivers need to be cool. Warming rivers um, can cause toxic algal blooms, which can then choke and kill salmon fish eggs. And when salmon exist in such low numbers, when any species exist in such low numbers, it really doesn't take much to wipe out an entire generation. So we need salmon. And I think salmon can be incredible teachers for us um, in how to overcome relentless obstacles. And that this journey with nature and against all these challenges like climate change and food security requires immense endurance and courage. And let's not forget that salmon also need, when they get all the way up to the headwaters, they need to leap. It's in their name. Salmo Salar means the leaper. They've evolved to leap over natural river geography, whether it's beaver dams or fallen trees. But again, we seem to have this habit of making a life that's already hard so much harder. In England, every one and a half kilometers is a man-made culvert. So again, these exhausted fish have so much to deal with. So next time you're feeling a bit down, just think of how much a salmon has to deal with. Um, the next species I want to introduce to you Oh, there's, there's more salmon. And that was a trip that I took that's in the book to go find them on the run, um, which is exciting. Oh, here we are. Right, third species is one that is all too easy to disregard, let alone know about. It's all too easy to forget about. It's the dung beetle. Philip referred to them a little bit. We've talked about soil. We're going to talk about it again. We cannot talk about soil enough. Um, and I should say that the stack of brownies very much has a role here which we'll come to in a minute. So the UK is in a dung deficit. I don't know if you've heard that on the radio. I certainly haven't. It would be great if we did. Um, as the other speakers have alluded to, we should have, or we used to have, a diversity of mammals roaming around the countryside, dropping a lovely diversity of dung. But unfortunately, well, I'm certainly seeing, the dung that I'm seeing around Devon especially, and the countryside, is not the consistency of an excellent brownie. An excellent brownie has that lovely crust on the top, gooey in the middle, self-contained, it holds itself. That is the perfect pile of dung that we need. But the dung that I'm seeing is runny, it's yellow, it stinks, it's a toxic mess from over-medicated cattle. And this is really bad news. We talked about soil. We've talked about the importance of soil as an ecosystem and a biome. Dung is vital for forming topsoil, which in itself is an endangered thing. It's at risk from extinction. In the UK, we've lost 84% of our topsoil. We're losing it at a rate of two to three centimetres a year. And it takes around 100 years to form an inch of really healthy topsoil. If we had a diversity of mammals, we would have a diversity of dung beetles. And dung beetles are the most in inspiring insects, I think, in terms of they look like nothing, you disregard them, and yet, oh my goodness, do they catalyze the most important processes, the soil cycle, the nutrient cycle, the carbon cycle. They can strengthen the countryside food chain right up to birds of prey, and then, of course, us. The power of the plate, the power of soil. Dung beetles are so important. And I think dung beetles give us an opportunity to be a powerful consumer. We've talked about choices, we've talked about organic farming. When we're next in the supermarket, have a look at where our food comes from. Is it local? Has the farm or the, the food producer practiced soil-friendly farming techniques? Because um, if we try and choose things that promote soil health and have come from a good place with high animal welfare, etc., we're going to be looking after the dung beetles, and these are the species that we really need. We would know for sure if we didn't have dung beetles about, because we'd all be buried in horrible, yellow, toxic poo. So, we have talked, there's a lovely pat. I saw that the other day. Photo just for you. Good brownie. Um, we've talked a lot about diversity, and we've talked about the gut microbiome, and I think 
The conclusion I'm coming towards is the power of an individual approach that's authentic and long-lasting and exciting. Um, research by Professor Tim Spector, who's a fellow 5 by 15 speaker, has shown that if you ingest 30 different plants a week, which sounds like a lot, but actually, when you include spices and things, it's very achievable. That can make our gut microbiome stronger. That can help our immune system to be more protective. We are protected. It allows us to adapt to stresses, and it allows us to recover from bouts of illness. It basically allows a healthy gut microbiome that's nurtured and looked after, allows us to be the humans that we were meant to be. Bigger, stronger, better, faster, smarter. And nature's biome is exactly the same. If we look after it, if we ensure that diversity, if we ensure the species and the food chains that I've mentioned today, then it will be more resilient, more protected, more able to recover and more productive for us as well, which obviously we need when we need to feed. So I think the conclusion I'm sort of getting to is, well, part of being a science writer and I guess part of all this, what the speakers have done today is to interrogate sources and lay out a balanced approach and then trust you and respect you enough to come up with a decision that works for you. Um, and so instead of telling you what to do or what not to do, although it'd be great if we stopped eating salmon and it would be brilliant if we ate more plants, um, I've laid everything out on the table and served the other speakers and now it's up to you to decide, which is a really exciting opportunity. It's a really cool position to be in. It's a real privilege to have a choice. Um, so, yes, I feel morally conflicted at times about what I should and shouldn't eat, depending on the company I'm in, but I've since found that activism or action for nature, whatever we want to call it, takes so many different definitions, and it falls under so many different guises, and I think it's so much more meaningful if it's true to you and authentic. So my gut instinct is to maybe step away from the noise, take some inspiration from our seagrass that just quietly cracks on and doesn't shout about things, but does amazing things in the background, and is very successful in that approach. Um, and instead of maybe being divisive or scrutinizing each other's choices, maybe focus that energy inwards on finding an approach that really excites you and inspires you. And I think that has a much higher chance of organically inspiring other people around you and promoting the power of the human community more so than telling each other what to do or what not to do. Um, and I think that tonight is a really good example of that approach of celebrating collaboration, creativity, curiosity, imagination and individuality. And I think that, for me, that is the activism that we need to be doing more of at the moment. Thank you.